from the start as an apprentice up to becoming a professor. OK, uh, so. So just a bit, a brief background on Professor Carl's career. He is an engineer with over 20 years of industrial and academic experience in mechanical engineering. He is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy, holds both a senior Withward and Whitworth scholar, and is also the past president of the Whitworth Society and was the 2009 IMAC Visionary Award for his outstanding leadership. So Professor Dunn leads the Tribology Research Group, which research that links mechanical engineering design with tribology and it's by its nature multidisciplinary. The applications of his research have been as diverse as engines that run on air to novel spinal implants from ball valves to fallopian tubes, which is also reflected in the variety of funding he has received to support it. So now I'm going to start the presentation. I'll share my screen and then you can take over. Thanks, Caddy. I will not hold it against you that you got the name of the research group wrong, given that you're a member of that research group, but we'll see how it goes when it, when your next review comes along. Sorry about that, it's mechanical. I forgot about that. Sorry. I read it this morning. It's OK, it's no problem. Uh, OK. So if you start the screen and yeah. I will then jump in. That's fab. Can I drive that? No, yeah, I don't think I can, can I? Can you, can you not do that? I'll request control. Yeah, so I can, yeah, hello. Uh, and that's that's me done then, isn't it, I think? Yes, so you have control now. Okay, there we are, look. Oops, oh, blimey, it's a little bit slow. Uh, so there, you'd think I'd be used to this by now, given the year that we just had having to move to uh, online teaching. But thanks very much, Caddy. I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today about my career. Uh, career. It's difficult as uh, an academic engineer, I think, to talk about yourself like this, but hopefully there is some interesting stuff. I think I'm very lucky, actually, that uh, I, I'm able to, to practice as an engineer whilst also being a, an academic as well and, and, and interacting with students with colleagues here and what I will do is spend maybe 20 minutes, half an hour or so and do stop me caddy as I said if I'm going on too much uh, to talk about some of the stuff that I've done uh, starting if you like and rooted in the um, the practical experience that I gained as an apprentice which has served me so very well as I've gone through uh, through my career. So, um, and actually, you, I'll just perhaps allude to it just very quickly, the, the round and round, but not always in circles. There's, there's two aspects, I think, that have struck me and stuck with me through my career, and that is the the, the wonderful uh, aspect of, of geometry, particularly the, ge the geometry of curves. So whether that's cam profiles through cycloidal, through simple harmonic motion, uh, through to the gear profiles, um, have stuck with me completely as has this 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 funny area of, of, of tribology as well, this study of friction, wear and lubrication, which as you'll see in a moment, I think affects every aspect of, of, of our lives. So instead of doing a, a, um, a contents page, I thought I'd just give you an overview of my career. So I was an apprentice, an advanced modern apprentice uh, in 1999. Um, so I started uh, working at Yale. Before that, actually, I'd, I'd worked at various uh, places in low paid manual jobs. So I'd worked on a building site. I'd worked on factory floors before that uh, and then decided. Um, and I, I think I'd always had an interest in engineering. You know, I was a great fan and remain a great fan of Lego, of, uh, of model building. But um, uh, I, after that period, or after having left school, I left school at, um, at, at the age of 16, not really knowing what I wanted to do. So drifted for a little while, but then got an apprenticeship uh, a couple of years after leaving school at, at Yale. And that was the, the transformational aspect, I suppose. So I was an apprentice at Yale. I'll talk about what I did uh, there after that. I met and came across a great Victorian engineer, Joseph Whitworth, who had a and continues to have a fundamental and very long ranging effect on my career. I first came across him in 2002 
while studying uh, at the University of Birmingham, where I read my undergraduate degree. Um, I was appointed to a lectureship here at Birmingham in 2008 and then got my PhD in 2009, which I think is is a little bit unusual to have been appointed without, first of all, having spent any time as a postdoc. Uh, and secondly, to have been appointed. It, it happens, but uh, it's unusual to be appointed before you get your PhD. And I think the reason I was able to do that, particularly having not spent any time as a postdoc, was because I was able to draw on that industrial experience that I'd gained. So Whitworth helped me once again after um, to, to support me during my um, my PhD. And then after electing my lectureship, I was a lecturer for quite a while, for about eight years, and then moved from lecture, le senior lecturer to reader in 2016 and was appointed as a prof, professor of mechanical engineering in 2020, which I had a badge as a child that my grandfather created for me with Professor Carl Dern on the, I think I was about six. So I now feel vindicated and somewhat, you know, I, I wear this badge now with, uh, with, with pride. So that's my career. Uh, what did I do as an apprentice uh, then? Why is that not going forward? Oops. Here we are. So, so this was so very important, I think, to, for, to, to have spent time. So, so I served um, 12 to 18 months as a technical apprentice, which included about nine months of off the job training school experience. So that was me spending time with other apprentices, not at Yale, but in a training center, learning to use fundamental um, engineering equipment, mechanical engineering equipment, manufacturing engineering equipment. So lathe, milling, bench fitting uh, and did some welding as well. Now that's so very important and I think that's something that's really stuck with me through my career is, is, is really having that fundamental understanding of how something is made and using that then as a platform to, to, to understand how it works, to understand how a component, a mechanical system behaves, but also in having in being able to then design a, a system as well. So where was the basis uh, for that? So I spent this time on the or, or, or off the job, if you like, in the in the training centre, then came back to Yale and spent another 18 months or so uh, on the shop floor. Now, that in, in, in many respects and in the tool room, first of all, then on the shop floor, on the production um, uh factory floor that was terribly important as well because not only do you have to understand when you design a mechanical system how to make the system first of all F fundamentally how you make something has a very very important effect on how it is designed but secondly uh, how you put the thing together is also terribly important because much of engineering particularly industrial engineering is very much around cost and money and economics and how quickly you can build something, particularly in mass manufacture. So Yale, I'm sorry, I, I assumed everybody would know what it is, but Yale essentially you all do and would know what that is. They manufacture locks. So when you go to your, your lock on your, your front door, those keys, those systems, those very coarse mechanical systems that are full of fantastic engineering principles. Uh, I, I worked in Willen Hall, which is just outside of Wolverhampton, just outside of Birmingham, um, for uh, and that's where I served my apprentices working on on those locks but actually so learning how to make something terribly important learning how to put something together terribly important in how you design it so when you group that together that design for manufacture design for assembly is so very important we can talk about it and why is it important I suppose to gain practical experience we can talk about it at university all you like but until you actually do it, I think, until you, you, you see the effect of making a design terribly complicated, until you see banks of operatives on the line putting these very, very intricate locks together, you get a real feel. You get you see a, a practical uh, reason for making sure that you uh, you keep your designs as simple as possible. And actually, I feel somewhat vindicated because I, I, I follow SpaceX quite a lot and saw something very recently. I think it was a tweet from Elon Musk that said, forget about the design of rockets. It's easy as anything to design a rocket to reach Mars. It's how you make it is the uh, is the killer. It's how you make it cost effectively within time budgets and, and robustly to be able to do that um, is, is the real difficulty. The, the design of those of those systems is, is very easy. So having spent time on the shop floor and the other functions of the business, I then became a design engineer at, uh, at Yale, worked in research and development 
and moved into special projects. And it was in special projects that I got uh, involved in, um, first of all, I suppose, designing of, of mechanisms. So there's some, they're, they're very coarse mechanical systems uh, locks, but actually they, they uh, embody, they include some really fantastic um, um, mechanical principles, as I've said. So much of it is based on CAM profiles. So uh, it, it's here where I first looked at and, and, and came across the idea of a CAM profile having a fundamental effect on how a lock operates, how a system operates, but also how um, how, how that's in, how you feel that, if you like. So so the idea of how you interact with mechanical systems, the lock mechanism is your direct link to this whole process, if you like. So the friction involved, the energy required to turn that key over is terribly, terribly important and can be optimized and can be reduced, first of all, by optimizing the geometry of the internal components. So you can see that on the screen here. Hopefully you can see my screen. This is the CAM profile. This is the, the essentially very, very simple uh, locking device. But this profile here started off uh, as just simple harmonic motion. But if you move that to higher orders, you can apply some, some, some trigonometry and all of that. Um, if you move that up, those orders of, 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 of magnitude, um, you, you can really start to, to, to change the feel of the lock by optimizing that curvature. And that's something that, um, that I looked at when I was looking at particularly high security locks. So I remember doing a job working on a bank where we were looking to reduce the amount of effort required to turn the key over in the very heavy locking system. There were two processes I looked at there. One was the profile of the, of the, of the CAM profiles inside. The other was looking at surface treatments is where I first came across this idea of tribology or the idea of studying friction, wear and lubrication. Fantastic work, but I got frustrated. Um, I got frustrated because I was quite experienced. You know, I, I'd spent quite a lot of time at, at, at Yale and then found that graduates were coming in much higher paid than I was. And um, I was, um, you know, they were asking me how to do stuff. So I thought, goodness, I seem to be missing a trick here somewhat. So then moved to, uh, to, to, to university to get my degree and well the lag here this is the first time i came across this uh, engineer sir joseph whitworth who is probably the world's be best mechanician and one of the certainly one of the fathers of modern metrology so you'd know whitworth perhaps from the standard thread form the the uh, the imperial thread form that's the 55 degree internal angle if you step back from that just a, a few steps how he did that was um, realized that um, you couldn't measure things very accurately. If you can't measure something accurately, you can't make it particularly well either. So actually his real innovation, if you like, his real step forward was to produce a truly flat plane. And when you've got a truly flat plane, you can then start to measure things very accurately. And then, you know, it rolls from that point. So uh, I think one of the first things he did after he'd flat plane, he produced a measuring machine of capable of measuring to a millionth of an inch. I don't think it really was a millionth of an inch. I think that's a little bit of marketing. Even in 1846, look, there's some marketing uh, going on there. But I think the, the point here was that it was very, very accurate. And actually, Whitworth's really interesting, I think, because what Whitworth did, it was clearly very, um, it was clearly very creative, clear, clearly very innovative, had 46 patents. But what he would do is look at systems in different ways and think, well, how can I improve it? What can I do better? And a perfect example of that is his development of the Whitworth um, rifle. So this was used heavily, wasn't adopted by the British or the French, of which it was first tended for, which is interesting, but used heavily by the, um, the, uh, the, the, in the American Civil War. In fact, there were sharpshooters, I forget the name of them now, that used, that were, were known for being incredibly good shots. The reason they were, uh, obviously, there's an element of skill, but it was because of Whitworth's rifle. When he looked at the Lee Enfield rifle, took it apart. There's a key to that. So he disassembled it. He dissected it, realized that the quality of the material wasn't particularly good. You know, that would fail. The, the, the musket would explode. So that, if you like, was the limiting factor. Again, he could design a, a good rifle. He has a, a hexagonal ball, for example, on the Whitworth rifle. But if you can't make good quality steel, if you can't make it well, there's no point in designing a state of the art, a fantastic rifle. So what he did was before he developed his rifle, he developed a whole new system of producing gun steel. Uh, and this is an, an image you can see here. And the, the product of that, uh, which he holds patents, he holds patents for the steel making process and for the rifle itself, 
is you can see here, look, I, I hope that's clear enough on your screens. This is a target using a Lee Enfield rifle at I think, um, what's the range? About 1600 yards, I think. This is the Lee Enfield, you see the, the spread is okay. But then you look at the Whitworth rifle at the same distance um, and it's, it's much more accurate. So I think it beat it by accuracy, depth and range. So all around, you know, the, the, the key contributing um, factors, the key performance aspects, the key performance parameters of a rifle beat, him, beat them, the Lee Enfield, the standard of the time on every, uh, on every basis. His real contribution, though, and why I'm, the, the long way around I'm getting to this, is that he recognised the importance of bringing industry and science much closer together, bringing industry and academia closer together. So forget the, the, the I would contend, in fact, forget the 55 degree angle, the key, uh, the, 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 the thread, the eponymous thread, the rifle, all of that stuff, the key contribution that Whitworth made was the founding of his Whitworth scholarships in 1856 that really recognised the importance of bringing academia and industry much closer together. What was the result of him realising that that was important? The foundation of the Whitworth scholarships, the scholarships that recognise and the importance and encourage apprentices to upgrade, to level up, to use modern parlance, to get to university, to move on in their careers. And it's a, there's a whole infrastructure, there's a whole ecosystem that's developed from those scholarships. There have been about 3,200 Whitworth scholars, um, and there is a society today that's founded, uh, at the, founded in uh, 1923 that comprises Whitworth scholars uh, from across, you know, multiple years, multiple, multiple uh, industries that still meet to remember uh, Whitworth's contribution. That was the award I got. They're quite prestigious. There are a, 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 only a, a small number awarded each year. The criteria is relatively uh, tight as well. So the eligibility, you have to have been an apprentice and you have to move to uh, to to uh, to um, uh, university to study afterwards. But fantastic, really very important. And actually, again, this idea of bringing industry and academia has permeated throughout my career. And it's the principles that guide me as I as I go forward now and look at how to develop materials and what we do with uh, with, with teaching and whatever else. Uh, let's just have a look at the next slide. Sorry, there's a lag between the two and I can't remember what slides come next. Here we are. Oh, oh blimey. So when I got to university, I rather liked the environment. Birmingham is a very nice place. If you've ever been to the campus here, it is fantastic. And it's then that I moved on. I was a little bit, can I say, bored, if you like, with cams and moved on to and, and cycloidal and simple harmonic curves. And then more th thought I could up the game of it with a little bit more of an elegant curve moving to the involute. So I moved into gearing, which are fantastically I mean, they, 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 they just about cover everything, don't they? I think you've got the elegance of the mathematics um, that, 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 that sit behind it and be behind the involute curve. And then if you look at how eponymous they are with, with modern life, if you like, they really are the driving elements behind most of mechanical engineering as well. So I moved into um, to, 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 to gearing and that's where I came across my supervisor and this where the title of this talk alludes to, if you like, where um, working with my supervisor, Professor Doug Walton, who was an expert in polymer gearing. Um, I did some research with him and that's just grown beyond now. So, I mean, the, the good thing is, I suppose, when you do a PhD, you become very, very knowledgeable in a very, very small area. So I am probably, you know, not wanting to boast. I've said I don't like boasting too much, but I'm probably one of the world's leading experts in polymer gears. Admittedly, there are probably 10 of us in the world, but I mean, not least, you know, I, I know an awful lot about polymer gears because we've done loads of, of, of work on them. And again, the interesting thing about those polymer gears are there's loads and loads of engineer, fundamental engineering principles embodied in those. So there's some fantastic physics involved in being able to predict how these gears work. And now what's the challenge, if you like, of polymer gears? Metal gears are easy. You know, metal gears are easy because they behave exactly as you want them to do, just as metals uh, do. The, the, the problem with polymers are is that they don't tend to behave. So they don't tend to follow the fundamental laws of friction. They don't follow um, the, the mechanical properties, aren't particularly stable, and it's all interlinked. So, so it all changes based on temperature, which changes the mechanical properties, which increases the temperature. And you get into these horrible um, loops, I suppose, these catch-22s. As an academic, 
as, as an applied academic, if you like, or as an industrial academic, there's some fantastic work that you can do here. And, and you know, much at some of the best times and, and some of the most interesting research I've done has been around polymer gears, whether that be some fundamental studies of the kinematics. And the great thing about them, if you like, of polymer gears is because you tend to run them dry, because they're much less stiff, much less, uh, have a much lower hardness, compared, well, no, didn't really count as hardness, but a much le less, um, compli much more compliance compared to steels. They leave everything, you know, if, if you imagine Sherlock Holmes, the evidence for how they behave, for what's happening with them is all over them. You know, they, they leave it all over the place for you to discover. So it's, it's fantastic. And we've done some work on kinematics, as I say, on heat transfer, on production methods, on the chemistry of the um, of, of, of the, um, the, the the gears as well. And I suppose, what would you say? What's the key thing we've learned from polymer gears? Well, the, the, I suppose the, the most important thing you can do if you're ever interested in applying polymer gears and particularly in material substitution. So getting rid of those heavy, cumbersome metal gears for some lightweight um, polymer gears. First thing you can do is just forget everything you know about gearing and start from uh, start from scratch if you like that's that's the really important thing and, and you know the, the the point here is that they behave completely differently compared to others so that's been a good part and a fairly substantial part of my uh, my career and i've had several very good phd students that have worked in this area as well so my research is basically you know to give you an idea of that uh, my research is in um tribology Mechanical design and tribology, I suppose. So, so really about uh, how to make mechanical systems, devices more efficient, work better, work in a more robust uh, manner. And I am an experimentalist as well. So the development of experimental uh, techniques to be able to replicate what you see <clears throat> and, and, and applications um, that, um, that and, and problems that may come up from all of that. So it's really about being able to take tribological principles, methodologies, engineering principles, and apply those in, in, in uh, to, to practical challenges. And there's been lots of those. And the, the good thing about that is it's nice and broad. So again, understanding how something is made, understanding the practical implications of what you're doing, and then being able to take the the, um, the the analytical aspects, the analytical tools as an engineer, I'm going to use a, a tooling analogy and apply those to those problems is, is, is really what it's all about as an academic engineer. And it's very broad, as you might expect. So I've worked, so to give you just a, a, a brief overview, where have I worked on, you know, ball valves, this was a fantastically interesting project that I did with TrueFlow that produce, um, again, relatively simple mechanical systems, but the physics involved in how you seal under very high pressures, high temperatures, very, very important. Work with TrueFlow, who predominantly made soft seated valves, so uh, seats. This is the valve face here. This is the ball that, that rotates within the, bal the valve body, and there's a seat that sits behind that. There's the seat look. Those seats can either be hard or soft, so either metal or, or polymer or rubber. Um, TrueFlow predominantly made um, uh, uh, soft seated valves and we wanted to move them or they wanted to move in perhaps into hard seated valves and we did some work with them to look at material types how the design of the, the valve might change to take into account the the, the, the differences in the uh, the material properties and it was a fantastically good project and I'll tell you why it's a good project it was a good academic challenge so as I say there was some good physics involved but TrueFlow were very very open to collaborating with the university so that did mean that we did some fundamental research with them. We did some some really good stuff with the knowledge transfer partnership that we had. That's whereby we have a research fellow that's employed by the university, but embedded entirely in the company. So that's really useful in that sense. But we were able to send students there. We got final year projects from students. Uh, three of the of the main design center, the design managers there now are students that started through this project and worked with them and then um, and then came through, excuse me, you'll have to let me just stop that. Um, so, so it was a really, really fertile, really, really fertile relationship, a really enjoyable project. And quite a lot of work on, and, and this is the great thing about tribology as well, I think, this idea of friction wear and lubrication can be applied to anything. So it really does involve any, almost anything you can think of will have an aspect of tribology involved in it. And it's a very, very rich subject. So I can draw on it. I have a background in mechanics. 
but I have to draw and to be able to, to work in tribology and to, to collaborate in tribology, I have to work with material scientists, with physicists, with chemists, all together to really be able to dig down to understand some of those fundamental challenges in understanding how lubricants behave, how we can reduce friction, how we can make things more efficient. So in all aspects, if you like, I've done some great work and some fantastic work um, uh, in China, in um, uh, particularly I spent six months in China uh, working with colleagues in Hefei, which was a real experience. You know, this is somebody that gets frightened when he gets outside of Birmingham towards Wolverhampton. You know, I once got to Wolverhampton, but then had to come back to Birmingham where I was born. Spent six months in China, which was a, a fantastic experience working with real uh, with, with chemists, with um, with other mechanical engineers to really understand the chemistry and the physics of some of these really interesting uh, developments in, in lubricants, in additives. So it's all to do with that, while simultaneously being able to apply what I know to make sure that the, the test methods, the experimental methods involved, were robust, were representative of the, the applications, of really being able to distinguish what the, the, uh, the mechanisms are that we were trying to discover. So there's so much of that. So there's, there's the fundamentals in terms of the chemistry, in terms of what's involved. But you can also use tribology, as I've, I've alluded to earlier, to diagnose things. So we've done some wonderful work with, um, I think it's wonderful anyway, you know, some, some really interesting work, some stuff where, you know, you, you sit at home at night and think, goodness, you know, this is fantastic. And get up in the morning and think, I can't wait to get to work to get involved with this uh, again. So we're looking at deposit formations. So really, really precisely made mechanical components where you know the, the clearances the tolerances in, involved are down to the micron looking at how deposit forms and what the the tribological effect and how, what the tribological catalyst is for the development of those and the, the formation of those um that those uh, deposits and then what the effect on performance is of the injectors of the other components that's involved uh, as caddy had mentioned earlier as well so we've done some uh, quite a lot of work on spinal implants and so one of my phd students you see here it's looking at debris and the development of debris, how you can identify what the mechanisms are, what the lubrication mechanism is, how the device is functioning by taking the debris away and looking at the debris. So you can you can determine what the kinematics are, what the um, what what the chemistry is, what's happening in the contact by looking at the degree. And the great thing about working at the university is that I act as a, an umbrella, if you like, and get to work with some fantastically bright, intelligent, uh, creative people. So, so this one here is, is, is one of my postdocs at the moment who develops some machine learning and vision, uh, uh, machine vision coding to be able to sift through hundreds and hundreds and thousands of microscopic images to be able to start to diagnose these things as well. So from the catalyst, and I still think, you know, the, the, the catalyst to all of this is this practical experience, is understanding how uh, the, uh, the the form, the function affects how something behaves. The catalyst is that, and then you pull in all of this resource being at the university to be able to study that. It's wonderful. Also gets you to work on really fantastically interesting new technologies. So this was the Dearman engine, which is, uh, you may have come across this <clears throat> in the news a couple of years back. This was an engine that would run on liquid nitrogen. And so with working with, again, some, some really bright, really fantastic people, and indeed some of the people that are still here at the university, we looked at some of the tribological changes you could make to make sure that you are uh, extracting as much of the expansion of that liquid nitrogen in the, in the I was going to say combustion chamber, I meant expansion chamber really, rather than pushing all of that, uh, that, that kinetic energy into overcoming friction, into heating components up. We want to minimise that so you're taking it as power. Um, and we also did, um, so, so some of the design work as well looked at how you can reconfigure the tanking uh, for, for that, um, for, for those, for carrying on things like transport refrigeration units, so that you are able to integrate it into a modern existing fleet with the minimum amount of, um, of, of disruption. So almost looking at retrofitting and design for retrofit to a, a fleet of, 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 of tanks. Um, Again, it's very, very broad, but done some, we've done some work with Marla looking at oil flow as well. So part of the work, so I'm an experimentalist, but also um, I'm building up quite a, a, an expertise 
with colleagues postdocs in modeling. So we've done some work on oil flow in bearings and looking what the minimum requirements are as we move to reduce emissions further you want to reduce things like the viscosity of the oils so you're not again using that fuel that you pay so much for at the pump to push the oil out of the way through the contacts and whatever else you're, you're reducing the amount of that so you're reducing the amount of oil that sits between those components great for efficiency really awful for durability so what are the limits of that so we did some modeling based on that and out of that actually and this is why academia is so fertile if you like it's such a fertile ground for ideas out of that then we realized that um, we could do some work with Marla looking at how they condition uh, they, they monitor the condition of their bearings and particularly when you've got very very low levels of lubrication seizure becomes a problem in plain bearings and how you diagnose that if you like again so that you don't lose the important evidence putting our deer stalkers back on as Sherlock Holmes again to look for those as detectives to look for those clues um, you do want you want to stop tests. You want to get you. You don't want to destroy evidence of um, a failure of something that suggests that something is happening. The mechanisms for that. So we were able to do some work on acoustic emissions and into implementing acoustic emission to help them diagnose seizure quicker than the modern way that or the, the existing ways that they were doing that, which was based on I think it was based on torque and based on um, on, on temperature rise as well. Acoustic emission much quicker to be able to diagnose that something was going wrong. So you could stop the rig and you could stop the test beforehand. And actually that's grown and they, uh, my interest in acoustic emission has grown. So I've done some work on gears, then some bearings and now Caddy, who you saw at the beginning here, is doing some work looking at how we can then take that uh, that that uh, non-destructive testing technique and apply that to the human body. So what can we do? What would happen if we were to monitor our arthro, uh, our arthritic joints or joints where or, or um, replace joints, you know, that tend to fail by wear, that tend to fail by dislocation uh, and movement? What can we use AE for to quicker diagnose that, I suppose? And that, that's something that Caddy's working on at the moment. The really, the really great benefit for uh, for for um, academia is that you can do whatever you like. Now, this is, I think, is is one of my probably highlight projects, and that was what I call it's the project name Born Slippy, uh, and the genesis for that is quite interesting actually because I have a small uh, four small children, uh, relatively small, they're getting a little bit older now. But uh, if anybody else is in that situation, you'll know there's only one room in the house where you can have true peace. And I was in this room reading the newspaper and came across a fantastic article uh, by a chap named Ben Moll, who was talking about this wonderful thing, this, this wonderful observation that um, if, if, a, if a female presents as infertile, um, there is a procedure, diagnostic procedure that they can undergo to make sure that their fallopian tubes are patent or open, that when they do that, and, and if it's done in a particular way with a particular medium, oil, if you use an oil as the medium, the contrast medium to open and to, to, to in, inject the radiolucent material into the um, into the fallopian tubes, they tend to fall pregnant at a much higher rate within six months of this of this process. So having been infertile, you have this done. It's called HSG. I won't try to pronounce the the uh, the medical name. If you have this done within six months, having been infertile, about 25 percent, something like that, were um were falling pregnant. And the really interesting thing I found was that um, Ben Moll, a world famous uh, gynecologist and obstetrician, didn't really know why that was. So then I started to think back, well, goodness, I know that oil, particularly poppy seed oil, which is a bio uh, oil, if you like, it's a food stock oil. Um, I know they're really good at lubricating things. So I wonder if there is any tribological effect that Ben Moll, as a gynecologist, would have no idea about. I'm sure there are um, physiological aspects of this poppy seed oil that may contribute to the increased pregnancy rate as well. But I wonder if there was a way that we could use some engineering principles, some tribological principles to test that and see if that was the case. And that's that was the, the genesis of, of born Slippy, if you like. And that's just coming to the end at the moment. And we found some really fantastic stuff. Having worked, so having read about this guy in the paper, I dropped him an email, told him that I got £300,000 from the government to be able to test that. And we still work together uh, now. So again, a perfect example of having this experience to draw upon, but also, you know, the the, the benefits of, of, of this very fertile, open uh, ground where you can really go wherever you like in academia. 
So I'm coming to the end now. I realise I'm almost at my <clears throat> time and my throat is drying up as well. But a um, big part of what I do here at the university and what permeates, again, my, my practical stuff is my teaching. So all of my teaching tends to be uh, based around design, around mechanical principles and machine element theory. <clears throat> and the way I tend to teach that is the idea that I'm not really going to touch the, the fundamental mechanics <clears throat> or the fundamental thermodynamics that's for other colleagues in other modules. What I want students to do and what I try to get them to do in my lectures and, and Caddy will have some experience of that and a few other people actually on the call that I can see that have been through uh, my lectures is to use those principles, the principles of fatigue, of bending moments, of, 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 of these kind of things and apply those to mechanical systems so you can understand how the um, how components are designed you can design components more robustly if you like. You can understand how they perform, how they're loaded, how they are, um, how they perform, I suppose. And, and that's the whole idea, if you like, that's the whole genesis that sits behind how we formulate all of, uh, of, of the lectures that I'm involved with. When I first got here as well, um, I, I, uh, when I was first appointed, I worked on workshop training, which again is, is so fantastically uh, important for um for, for our new students so many of our students when they get to to birmingham will come here having liked maths and physics and never really had any experience of engineering which of course is is really missing out a huge chunk of of, of really what engineering is all about so we get them to go off to the training center uh, we used to do that actually you know they, they do it now in-house uh, to, to get an idea of how things are made when i did my degree we made a, a, a clock uh, so we designed the clock in in a CAD package and then went off to the training centre um, to, uh, to 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 use a milling machine, to use a lathe, do some filing, uh, which, of course, as an apprentice. And if you come with that experience is a very, very, uh, very, very easy thing for you to do. But then, of course, you help other people and whatever else. So that was that was something we did. And then um, perhaps one of the transformational things that I've been able to do at Birmingham and I think this has had such an effect on my career is um, I was always interested in the idea that when anybody says, you know, why, why did you pick engineering? They say, well, I used to like to take things apart. So the, 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 um, the idea that sits behind that, if you like, if you unpack that, if you deconstruct that, is that there is a an educational benefit to being able to um, to understand how something is made. So if you can see it, if you can take it apart, I think you get a real appreciation for how it's made, how it's designed, why it's designed that way. Uh, and that's really, really valuable to students that perhaps don't have a great deal of practical experience. Now, I've spent a couple of years doing that with fast, uh, what do they call them, fast moving white goods, printers. I think we did printer, uh, vacuum cleaner, Dyson vacuum cleaners are really great for that because they're designed beautifully and fit together beautifully. And then one of my colleagues uh, sat next to a... Um, the, the product design uh, the product design director at Aston Martin talked to him about some of the stuff we were doing together we were teaching together then and the dissection project that I was running and it was Ian Minard at the time said goodness I know what we've got we've got a, a car if it's any use you know you can have a car you can take it apart and that was really the the whole idea that that sat behind that and that that was a an Aston Martin that would come to the university that the students would take apart that would strip down uh, they didn't have to put it back together and if you see them after the cars afterwards you'd realize why they didn't put them back together but they really took it to, to, to town but the car i mean it's such a unique experience they'd take the car apart and then look in detail at where that form function manufacturing is embodied in whatever system they had so we break the car down into maybe the the engine block the um the wheels the exhaust system the doors i don't know the bright work it could, there are about 40 different systems we broke it down into and they take that apart and spend the week really analyzing that in great detail. Fantastic experience. You can see some examples here. You know, some of these students will have had no experience of, um, of, of real engineering. And this is this is the, you know, the real the closest that have got to that. A little word of warning you see here. So this is me driving Aston Martin. I look good in Aston Martin. I agree. Problem is with that. Don't get too uh, complacent in these things because you can see here, you know, doing terribly well, got the students out watching the, you know, the cool prof moving the Aston Martin. What nobody told me was that the handbrake in an Aston Martin is a bit different. So I hadn't disengaged the, the handbrake. And you can see here that smoke is, in fact, the um, 
the brakes wearing away and heating up. So that's not what to do with an Aston Martin. And just to cap it all off, there we are, look. The next one, I'd managed to stall it and then couldn't restart it. And you'll note here, so they're jump starting it for me from a battery, the students. But this guy, look, <laughs> which is great. This is Camel, uh, who, uh, who he graduated a couple of years back. He's holding the car there because I've burnt the handbrake out and can't stop it. So that's a good warning not to get too, uh, too arrogant, not to get too, uh, too, too, um, too set in your ways. Some other stuff just to finish off very quickly. Amazing. Uh, I think wherever you go to university, you'll have, you'll have got involved with that. Um, you'll be racing with formula student. But again, it's been so enriching. Um, I, since I've been head of department, I haven't really been involved in formula student, which is a great shame. The, um, the richness of my academic career, if you like, has definitely dropped since I've not been as involved in 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 in, um, in formula student. But again, a wonderful the idea here, students start each year with a blank sheet of paper and end up with a, a single seat race car that accelerates to 60 miles per hour um, faster than a, a Porsche 911. So it's, you know, very real pieces of engineering. And again, fantastic in terms of practical experience for the students. Um, and again, as I say, why is it enriching? So you get to see the students do that, but it actually, you know, I've met MPs, I've been to the House of Lords, I've been all over the world with Carl Hingley, as you can see here, and colleagues um, to talk about UB Racing. So, you know, as a student project, it is a fantastic vehicle for the students, but for the university. And it has been for me as well. And this was a team that was from Hefei, uh, sorry, this was from South China University of Technology, who were first time in the UK, and they knocked that car up. That's an electric vehicle. They knocked that up in a weekend, I think. They, they came over here, with bits in a container, um, a, a shipping container. They dropped it in the yard here in mechanical engineering and had it built. And I, I'm pretty sure it ran. I don't, I, I don't think they did particularly well. Well, it depends on your, your measure of well, but it certainly ran at Silverstone then afterwards. So really fantastic um, experiences. So to finish off, why don't I like to fly? The problem is when you become an engineer like this, as I'm sure you will know, and I, I'm going to risk it here by getting by alluding to the Matrix. So if you know the films by the, the is it the Wisconsin um, uh, brothers, starring Keanu Reeves, the Matrix, the idea you can see a computer code rather than the real world all around you. It's a bit like that as an engineer. So whenever I get onto a, an aircraft, you know, as I've shown you before, I'm very interested in fuels. Fuels are very volatile and engineering systems are incredibly complex. And this is the um, this is the cowling that was blown off the um, the uh, I think this was an A380 that was flying from uh, was it Sydney to Singapore somewhere like that and anyway the um, they had a fuel line failure so again very very complex fuel line failure fuel had settled on the cowling and then the heat of the engine and whatever else had blown that off terrifying number two uh, I teach fatigue. Now, what's a, um, a wing? Uh, there's a spar and the uh, the wings of a an aircraft. What's that made of? <clears throat> Aluminium. What's the problem with that? Here we are. Look. Two little examples. Can you see that there? I don't know if you can, but these are tensile test specimens made of exactly the same material. So this is aluminium and this is aluminium. Same grade of aluminium, same same material loaded in exactly the same way. Why am I terrified of flying? It's because of this look. So this one has failed by a crack here. Look. In the uh, in the lower holder, this one. Oh no, that that one. Let me grab that one. This one. Look, the end. There's no crack in. Here we are. Look, there's no crack down here. There's a crack here, but this end, it's gone. It's failed in a completely different place. That terrifies me because that means. And you know, if you look, go back to your SN curve. When you start to think about that, where's the where's the knee? Where's the knee in the SN curve that says that aluminium is that uh, aluminium is going to be safe? It doesn't exist. I don't like flying. And most of all. Is a wonderful look at this for a, an amazing piece of engineering. What's this here? Look, that is a rolling element bearing. Now, anybody will tell you the very basic um, equation to, to specify a roller bearing is the L10 equation. What's the meaning? What's the practical implication of the L10 meaning? Well, that of every 100 bearings, about 10% of those will fail, 90 will be fine. Is this one of the 10%? I don't know. Is, the one, of the, is, is, is one of the 10% on the engine of the plane that I get on? This is why I don't like flying. I think the, end, the, the the understanding of the practical world spoils everything for you. And I think with that, just to acknowledge all of what I've talked about would not be possible without this. This is my current group. I've worked with lots of students 
and lots of people and colleagues all the way through. But this is the most recent copy, most recent um, picture that I have of the group. Not all of us of them are, are still with us, but um, these are the great people that you get to work with. And indeed, many of the colleagues on this telephone call, uh, this uh, webinar as well. And then just finally, to finish off, this was uh, there's not a good uh, picture at all, but this is when I got my PhD and this was my supervisor who sadly passed away two uh, two or so, or maybe it's more than that now, four years ago. But actually, um, his inaugural lecture was called Round and Round and Not Always in Circles. So I thought I would dedicate this webinar to him and to, uh, to, to acknowledge the effect that he had on my career. And with that, I think I'm miles over. But um, thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. And uh, Caddy, I think I'll pass back to you. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. So I'm just stop presenting. So thank you for that wonderful, inspiring, engaging talk. You know, even though I was looking at the time, I couldn't really stop you because I just felt let's keep going and we could listen to you forever. So it was really nice. Knowing you for so long, I didn't even know some of those things you just said. So it was really nice to find out how your career has moved and thank you for that. Uh, we are running out of time a little bit, so I'd like to invite if there are any questions, uh, you can use the chat box. You can also raise your hand and I can unmute you. I noticed someone asked earlier on if you can share your LinkedIn so that they can network with you on LinkedIn. So they wanted to know your LinkedIn. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so this is probably the easiest thing to do if you just Google my name. It comes up. It's about the second or third hit on there. Yeah, exactly. So if we just Google Carl Dern, it's going to work. That should be fine. So are there any questions from the from the listeners today? That would be lovely. You can put in the chat box or raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can also say your questions out if you want. So I had a question that I wanted to ask because Obviously, like you said, you went from, you know, being an apprentice to studying engineering. So now we have young students, maybe 16, 17, 18, deciding on what they, the path they should take. How would you advise uh, students of that age to decide if going the apprenticeship route is right for them or what, you know, what path to take to being an engineer, they have an interest in engineering? How, what would you advise them? How do they decide, make that kind of decision? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Kenny. I mean, th th in many respects, it's never really been a better time to be an apprentice because there are so many different routes now into engineering. So in the past, when I was a um, when I was an apprentice, it would have been unusual for somebody to have done A levels, for example, um, and and then become an apprentice and, and and gone on to university and whatever else but now you can do degree apprenticeships and there's modern and then craft apprenticeship technical apprenticeships so i think there's lots of them but how would i do, diagnose it do you know that's a that's a really great question i suspect at 16 15 16 17 uh minds may well already have been made up i think what we can do is as engineers is just make sure that people understand what we do what the opportunities are, I think you have to start much earlier, actually, if you really want to make a fundamental change. And in particular, if you want to address things like gender balance and and um, and, and perhaps the ethnic balance and, and these kind of fundamental problems, I think you have to start much earlier than that. The other thing I think is for anybody really, and at whatever age is, I think you just need a bit of enthusiasm when you talk about stuff as well. Be proud of what you do. Be proud of, of 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 being an engineer and talk about some of the stuff that you do. And, and you know, I, I'm fully aware. I'm, I'm wide, eyes wide open. I realise that a lot of engineering is very dull, playing with 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 spreadsheets and whatever else. But but a lot of it isn't. You know, and and there are aspects of it that there isn't as well. So I think really just being able to talk with enthusiasm that most you know most engineers that I come across do have a certain amount of enthusiasm for students that want to that are maybe 18 and thinking about coming to university, thinking about reading engineering, my strong advice to anybody actually that's that's considering engineering, whatever the age, is to get as much experience as possible. You don't have to do an apprenticeship. It helps an awful lot. 
But you don't have to do an apprenticeship. But what you can do is get experience, I think. Get an idea of what it's like to be an engineer, how you do stuff, get practical experience, understand how things are made, understand how decisions you make at various stages of product development have an effect on things. Because there are a couple of reasons for that, I suppose. One is that you've no idea if you just come with maths and physics and chemistry and in interest in those. No real idea if you like engineering. You might like maths more or you might like physics more. You know, so, so get an experience of, of engineering, get a, get a feel for what it's like. And the same when you're doing your degree as well, I think. Get as much experience doing your degree as possible. Because again, you don't want to be graduating and then not really understand what engineering is, not understand what the different branches are, what the different functions are, what the different things you can do are in engineering. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That is a very great answer. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask was, um, are there any challenges you've acquired throughout your career journey and how you would advise anyone maybe facing those challenges or, you know, how they can avoid those challenges? Yeah, I've got some poor PhD students. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, challenges, goodness. I'm sure there has been. Um, Goodness, that's such a that's such a wide ranging question to think of specifics. Yeah, I tell you, I tell you something. What I would say is again, this was this was a benefit of the Whitworth Society. But don't don't. I, I think there is a modern trend to disregard experience, and um, I think that can be so important. So so I think what I would say is I don't know what the challenge is, but I have definitely faced points in my career, and this is right back from an apprentice time. Points in my career where I thought, goodness, I've no idea what to do. I'm at a fork. You know what I mean by that? I mean, I mean, I can make two decisions here that could go either way. Okay. You don't have to make those decisions on your own. You are you, there'll be people around you that are further on in their career that have some experience that can, you can draw on. You can speak to about those kind of things. So in my case, um, I've been able to draw on some of the really great, experienced engineers in the Whitworth Society. And, and something I've learned from them is that, and it's the same approach now when I, I when students come to me with challenges, you know, I won't make a decision for you. And when I've spoken to people, there was one particular, Dr. Chris, um, uh, Michael Wood, who was at Cambridge, but a Rolls-Royce apprentice and worked at Rolls-Royce for many years. You know, I, I asked him about whether I should take a, a, the lectureship here and whether I should apply for it. I wasn't sure if I should. And um, he didn't tell me one way or the other. So when I said to him, I don't know what to do, he didn't say you should do this, Carl. What he did was, was take me through each one of those routes as he saw it. And that was just so beneficial to have somebody who's had some experience to look at those routes and what the potential pitfalls are of going either way, one way or the other. So I would say, <coughs> excuse me, cutting my throat, he's drawing out. Um, I would say, don't, don't underestimate that experience. Use everything you've got around you. Because people will help, you know, if you ask for people for advice on careers, on, 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 on difficult problems, you know, generally they'll they'll help you with that stuff. <laughs> Not least because it's flattering. Yes, thank you. Um, I think there's someone typing, so I'm going to wait and see I, if he finishes is, typing. This is it's going to be the longest question in the world because that, that's been... <laughs> yeah, he has been typing for quite a for while, so... Time. I'm going to hopefully wait. So I think I don't have any more questions. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, while we're waiting for the last question to come on when you finish typing. Uh, so uh, thank you so much uh, for giving this presentation. Thank this you talk. for listening. And I hope it was in some way, you know, thought provoking at least. Or yes, if it helped one person, then it uh, it will have been useful. I'm sure it must have helped a lot. At least for me, it's helped me a lot, you know, just to understand making decisions, like you said. So it's just getting an insight into how things are, you know, what kind of part you can take in life. It's definitely helped me. So thank you for that. Um, uh, so just uh, to round up, if I don't know if going to ask a question, but I'm still waiting. Uh, so we have other events. If you go to the IMAKI Birmingham Members Panel website, other events advertised there. And if anyone has any ideas for events, they are welcome to suggest events as well. OK, so he said, maybe it was just the network. The question was, how properly were you placed when you... Yeah. So, so when I, you're in academia, so, then trust from industry. So, so I think um, I, I, I interpret that as how, how was it in terms of um, 
not not coming from an academic background, how was it as a, moving into an academic environment? Which I think is a is a. I hope that's I'm interpreting that correctly. That's a super question because it was difficult. Is is in a short word, it was very very difficult, and it was difficult because as you as you will know, I'm assuming look PhD mechanical engineering. Oh, the internal candidate. So you're here. You'll have to come along and say hello. Um, you can imagine uh, you you won't have you know the maths anywhere near to the level that you should have. That an A-level student would. Some of the so some of the the, the real uh, academic subjects were were a challenge in the in the first and second year. I think the difference is though that when you get to university as an apprentice, you're already used to working in a a professional environment. You're conditioned to be getting up at eight o'clock every you know seven o'clock in the morning, going to work, coming back in the afternoon, and whatever else. So certainly from my perspective, I treated my degree very much like it was a job, and so actually. I was I was well behind when it came to mathematics. It was tough, but I sat down with a copy of Ken Stroud. So if anybody's in that sim sim similar situation, Ken Stroud is essentially a maths book, engineering mathematics of examples. And you go through that, you know, you work through that, you put in the extra time. The university at that point as well put on remedial maths lessons that were very, very useful, that I found really, really um, useful. And actually, I found by the end of the first year, which is essentially a bridging year anyway, um, by the time I got to the end of the first year, I was up with everybody else by then anyway. So it was a bit of a struggle in the first year. Having said that, all of the all of the engineering focus modules, the practical engineering modules, the design modules, the materials, the manufacturing was really easy because it was all from from, from very basic first principle stuff that I'd been doing for six, seven, year, eight years worth of experience by the time I got here. So what I could say there, if, if you like, I could then reinvest time in the in mathematics so it was tough in one sense but I, know, I think an apprenticeship conditions you somewhat and you know you can put that extra work in to be able to to, to, to bridge that okay. um that, that's a really good question there from cdh engineering consultancy um no i i don't think they are to be perfectly honest and it depends on the branch of engineering and what the students want to do afterwards but in my opinion the more practical experience that they can get. And the more we can do, actually, I, I th I'm not going to push that just to, uh, to 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 industry. I think that's the universities that need to to do that. But we can't do that on our own. We need industry to be able to do that. But we do need projects like I've talked about, I think, um, practical stuff, stuff where you apply stuff so that you're ready for um for for industry i think the other thing that we do really badly are you still recording <laughs> i should be careful with this but one thing that we don't do is i don't think we prepare students quite well enough for the softer side of engineering of the fact that when you go into industry 